if you put us in the scene as it happened, showing us the details as they happened then to the best of your recollection, the specific always makes it universal. The more specific we are, the more believable and um, more empathy our readers will have for us. Welcome to the Author Like a Boss podcast, the podcast for indie authors who want to improve their writing, up-level their marketing, make money with their books, and have fun doing it. Now onto the show with your host, Ella Barnard. Hey bosses, writing quality stories isn't usually a problem for the listeners of this podcast. However, writing stories that specifically appeal to readers in your genre is one of the secret challenges that many indie authors face that keeps them from making real money as an author. In this episode with Rachel Heron, we chat about how to write your story, your memoirs, in a way that appeals to readers. She tells us how to capitalize on sharing the little moments in your life so that they resonate with people and ultimately resonate with your fans. If writing stories that lots of readers in your genre love is one of your challenges, even if your genre isn't memoir and you want to learn even more about how to author like a boss and become an empowered six-figure indie author, come to my free masterclass. You can sign up at authorlikeaboss.com forward slash A-L-A-B masterclass. Hello, bosses. Hello, everybody. We are here with Rachel Heron. I am super excited to interview her. She's like, I feel like hopefully by the end of this interview, we'll both feel like we are soul buddies. <laughs> Heck yeah. Spirit sisters. <laughs> she is an international, the internationally best selling author of more than two dozen books, including the thrillers under R.H. Heron, mainstream fiction, feminist romance, memoir, and nonfiction about writing. She received her MFA in writing from Mills College, Oakland, and she teaches writing extension workshops at both UC Berkeley and Stanford. She's a proud member of the NaNoWriMo Writers Board, and she's also a New, Ze New Zealand citizen as well as an American. Welcome to the show, Rachel. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here with you. Yeah, I'm and we're really all, we're already pals. So I, I I feel like it. You guys, I read her blog, <laughs> and I was deal. like, I was like. Oh, I need to know her. <laughs> like, awesome. this is so awesome. Okay. So I start every interview with, uh, tell us a little bit more about yourself and your author journey. So our listeners can be like, Oh, that's Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, like probably many of your authors, I, I knew that I wanted to be a writer when I was little, but I, I particularly remember the moment that I realized there was a person behind the books I loved, I already loved the books, but to know that there was a person and a person had that job, I was probably about five or so. And I knew that I wanted that job in particular. So then I proceeded to, you know, go through school and I was headed toward a business degree because everybody told me I couldn't be a writer. And I almost, you know, bombed out of college and I just hated what I was doing. And then I changed to English and I did fine. And then I went off and got a master's in creative writing and and that was great. And then I proceeded to spend seven years trying to write the great American novel and completely failing. I had had a hard time in grad school. It was one of those critique heavy grad schools where, you know, it, it, it's not a real critique session unless the author leaves crying, you know, when we all oh. left crying every day. And so for seven years, I was trying to be highly literary and highly excellent and, you know, write the best book in the world. So I was turning out, you know, half a book here, half a book there. I wrote about 500 pages of a of a book. I don't even think I got to the inciting incident in that, those 500 pages. <laughs> it was like an extended character sketch. It was awful. So that's what I was doing for seven years. And then in 2006, my sister, one of my sisters told me about National Novel Writing Month, which is NaNoWriMo. Have you played before? I haven't. Oh, I know. Okay. It's so I great. know. So I will. I will. For your one listener who doesn't know what it is, um, mm -hmm. National Novel Writing Month is in the month of November. It's an online lark. Um, you play along by signing up to write 50,000 words in the month of November. They don't have to be good words. In fact, they won't be good words. They'll be probably very terrible words. But I told my sister I would never do something like that, that I was a literary writer. And, you know, <laughs> no self-respecting writer would uh -huh. do something like that, you know, hurry through a novel. And then as soon as she left my house, I started Googling it and it 
just caught my interest. And I signed up and this was, you know, a couple weeks before NaNoWriMo started that year. And I knew that if I was going to write something that fast, it would have to be things that I loved. And I love, love, I love romance and I love knitting a lot. I'm a big knitter. And this was before knit lit was a genre. I think Friday night knitting had just come out. Um, but it was kind of the first of his thing. So I wrote this romance, um, between a, sh- uh, a sheep rancher and a knitter. And my log line was something like, um, they both need, wool but not to generate heat because they generate enough of their own (laughs) (laughs) and it was and I spent I spent that November like writing so fast and so badly and it was really exhilarating I'd never done anything like that I just turned off the inner editor for the very first time and I knew that I was writing a very very bad book and when I was done I wrote like 50,000 in two words you know which counts for winning and I put it away and I looked at it the next year and I was expecting to be completely horrified. And instead, what I found was certainly a lot of bad writing, um, very, very not good writing. But I also found a lot of some of the best writing I'd ever done because I had gotten out of my way and I realized that I had something to edit. I had never revised anything before because I'd never finished anything before. <laughs> so I revised that in, in kind of, you know, a sloppy way as best I knew how. Um, I sent out for that. That's when I started clearing agents. Um, I got my amazing agent on the 32nd rejection. So that's a good number for, for people to have in mind. Mm -hmm. Um, although it's on, although I've heard much higher, but yeah, she was lucky number 32, but she's, she's wonderful and a good friend and has done everything for me. And she sold that book in a three book deal to Harper Collins at auction. And that's how I started. Wow. So my first book came out in 2010 and I've had a couple dozen since then. And I am, I was working 911 after I got out of college. I just wanted a job that would give me story ideas, but also give me a lot of hours off. Like we worked really long hours, but then I'd have three or four days off in a row. So I had a lot of writing time. And why did I say that? Oh, um, so now I am a full-time writer for the last three years, which is seriously the best. Um, and I did have a point. Where was I going with that? It's already lost, Ella. I know. Is, we're dooming the interview. Rachel no, lost no. her train of thought. No, no. <laughs> this is like, there's like one of these on at least every interview. Usually it's oh. me, though. <laughs> okay. I, I came back to it. I wanted to tell people um, that I am really happily hybrid now. I uh, I self-publish my romance, and I traditionally publish the other stuff, although I self-published my book on writing memoir. So I give my agent what I want to give her, which is the more literary stuff and the thriller um, and some of my nonfiction. And and I get to self-pub the rest. So mm. it's, it's a really awesome, sweet spot to be in. Okay. I have so many questions <laughs> diving into that. Yeah. I was like, okay, because reading your bio, looking at it, I'm like, okay, what are the things that she's self-publishing? What are the things? <laughs> what do you mean when you say the thing that my agents like? Oh, the things that the things that she wants, basically, she, oh, yeah. she doesn't want to sell my romance for me anymore. She did for a long time, but now she doesn't because honestly, I bombed in romance in America. Like I could not sell a book for a long time in America. Um, my first five romances here, mm-hmm. just like the first one sold well. And then I just ate it big time. Um, The second book came out the week borders closed. So we had no more, you know, no more, you know, RIP borders, no more romance landia in there. And I just didn't do well, but I did become a bestseller of those romances in Australia. So then, uh, then there was Australia and New Zealand. And then there was this weird time that my agent would sell my romances to Random House Australia for publication in Australia and New Zealand. And then I kept the rights for everywhere else, which was the best deal. I'm not doing that anymore, unfortunately. But the cool thing was, is my editor bought me. She paid for me. She edited me. I had oh. copy edits. The only thing I had to do was pay for, you know, a, another copy edit to put everything into American standard spelling. But that's, that's it. And then I could self-publish worldwide and they just had um, Australia and New Zealand. So for a while I was like a hybrid hybrid, which was Great. And if I, I just kind of slowed down on writing romance, I'm not as into writing romance as I was. I'm, I've kind of burned myself out. Mm-hmm. But if I went back to it, I would I would definitely pitch to my old editor there the same kind of deal. Same deal. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So burn down. On, you, this is 2010. We're now 2019. Yeah. <laughs> so 
Okay, so I need, I'm just curious about the transition because now, now you're writing numerous genres and that's something that a lot of people have questions about because yeah. who want to be successful, they're like, how do I do this? And I, I'm wondering what your recommendations are for people who want to be able to write full time around having multiple genres. And you might be a unique situation because you're doing both indie and traditional. Yeah. But I'm curious what your thoughts are. And I don't think that, you know, my, what I'm doing should tell anybody not to try to do that too. You know, go ahead and self-publish some books and then keep your best book back. Don't self-publish that one and try to get an agent with that and, and try to establish a presence in the traditional world if you can, if that's what you want. Um, I, the studies show that hybrid writers, the people who do do both actually do make more money. They're the ones who bring in the most income across, you know, averages. Mm -hmm. So, because I do think, you know, you have one foot in each stream. I think that's the metaphor. I think Mm -hmm. that's the (laughs) thing. Of income. Um, (laughs) Of income. Of income. In each stream of income. (laughs) Exactly. So you don't have to start trad and then go self-pub to to be hybrid. You can start self-pub and then go trad to be hybrid. Of course, I think the best advice for anybody looking to make money with self-publishing is writing in a series is really, I still believe the way to do it. Writing in a series, put the first book free in the series and get your readers that way. That's the way I've made money. That's the way I still have sell through, buy through, read through, great reviews, that, that kind of thing. Um, But that's not what a person wants to hear if they want to write in multiple genres. And that's what, that's what I really want. And I think that it's just okay to follow your heart and what your heart wants. I wanted to write romance for a long time and I had a a really good time with it. And then I didn't, I woke up and I just really wanted to write something more mainstream, something a lot darker, you know, family drama with the death and, and stuff like that. So, um, I sold four, four books to Penguin, but it wasn't, it wasn't easy to break into Penguin from romance because in America I'd proven myself as a crappy sales person on the romance side, right? So I couldn't sell on proposal. I had to write a whole I, pack up the moon was that book, the, the move from romance to women's fiction. And I wrote that whole book on spec and then I wrote it over again on spec and then I wrote it over again on spec. It was one of those books I edited for maybe like a year and a half because uh, when the book was done and and published, it was 95, 97,000 words, I think, but there are 102,000 words in the trash can that were not duplicated. So there's a whole nother book in there. But so yeah, I had to sell on proposal for that to, to prove that I could make the jump, to prove that I could complete a book that they would want to sell. And I had to do the same thing for Thriller because I've never been published in Thriller. The Thriller that's coming out from Penguin in August is called Stolen Things. And I had to prove that I could write it. I had to write the whole thing. All you know, And while you're writing a book on proposal, you're also writing to your contracts. So it's one mm-hmm. of those things. It's really a balancing a balancing thing to try to do. And when you talk about um, under one name, I've always written under one name. All right. I had a brief foray into a pen name, but I came back to my real name, Rachel Heron. And they want um, the uh, penguin for the thriller wants initials. Cause it's, I assume it's because it's more, more dudes. Gender, yeah, yeah. Yeah, gender neutral, a little bit more androgynous. So I'm writing under my real name, which is R H Heron, but it's, pretty much a pseudonym to Rachel Heron, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so it, although it is my name, that is my middle initial. So, um, and I, I, I don't know how I feel about that. I think I, I like it because of the algorithm, right? Amazon won't get confused and, and try to sell anybody who mm-hmm. buys stolen things, other things, but it does, it does feel, I don't know, it just smacks up a tiny bit of deception and I don't love it, but that wasn't, that was not my call to make. That was marketing's call. <laughs> And they, got, and they got to make that. And R.H. Heron does sound kind of tough. So I am, but I am, I'm branding now and I'm in the process of moving everything over so that all of my social media and stuff just says R.H. Heron slash Rachel Heron. It's not like it's a secret. It's all one. Okay. So people, so people who know, you know, but when they, but it makes it easier them for, to find, oh, I read her, I read her thrillers exactly. under this. Exactly. I read her feminist romances under this. Maybe I. <laughs> Maybe I'd like to try this, right? Which, yeah. you know, makes sense to me because um, the thriller's under Penguin, the women's fiction's under Penguin, so it's but under a different name. So I'm just trying to help them out, really. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and myself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, man. 
Cash, you have so much stuff that I could deep dive into, but <laughs> and and I'm gonna deep dive into something that we haven't re- we barely even talked about yet, but I'm really curious about. Hey, <laughs> so yay. you write memoir? Yes, love it. It's my it's my one passion. It's my biggest passion in writing. Yeah, it's so many people who want to write a book. You know, they always wanted to write a book. A lot of them want to tell their own story. Yeah, yeah. You know, when you're first starting out and if you haven't been writing very much before, and I don't know if you found this true, but I have found it that, you know, we all find our own story very, very interesting because it's our life. <laughs> right. You're right. We're, in, we're inside it. Yeah. We're like, this is fascinating. Can you believe all this stuff that happened to me? And I haven't looked at your memoirs. And so I'm like, I'm just going to presume. How do you help those people or you yourself to write memoir in a way that it it becomes a story for someone else. I love this question because it is probably the number one mistake of beginners. Mm-hmm. When they start with memoir, they they write basically what happened to them and they're at this 30,000 foot view, you know, and then my mother left me and I cried and it was very sad and then she abused me and blah, 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 you know, um, but we're never in the moment where we're really held at more than arm's length um, as they gloss over what happened and then tell us how it felt, which nobody cares. Mm -hmm. Literally nobody cares. That's what I always um, tell students is that like, if somebody comes up to you in the street tomorrow, a random stranger and grabs your arm and said, you know, Oh my God, my dad just died. You would feel very bad for them as another human being. And you could empathize, you know, because you yourself have lost people, but you don't really care about this person. You don't care about them at all. You didn't care about them 30 seconds ago before they grabbed your arm, which is why in memoir, you take some time to do the act one setup memoir is structured exactly like novels, um, exactly like any other story structure. You take time with a setup, get them to care about this, set up the stake, set up the foreshadowing, and then give them the inciting incident of what is this particular story about. And that leads to problem. The, the second mistake that beginning memoirists make is that they try to tell the story of their life. And you can't do that in a memoir. The story of your life goes in an autobiography mm-hmm. that, and you get one, you get one of those, um, Quentin Crisp famously said, an autobiography is serialized obituary with the last chapter missing. Mm. So, so, you know, and you only get one, but memoir, you, you choose a theme or a time in your life. Like, you know, the time that you hiked the Himalayas, or if you're writing on theme, um, one of my books is called a life in stitches and it's my life in chapters as seen through the sweaters that were on my needles at the time. So the sweater I was making when I got married, the sweater I was making when my mom died, um, that kind of thing. So either a theme or a slice of time is what your memoir is based on. So the inciting incident launches you into that period of time in your life. And then third, the thing that any memoirist wants to do, just like any novelist, is instead of telling somebody what happened, you know, it shows. It's, it's, it comes down to show, don't tell. Again, mm-hmm. you need to get them on the ground. Um, nobody, nobody cares if your mom yelled at you after swim practice, but if they see your mom yelling and see the the froth in the corner of her mouth and the way her hair was crazy on the right hand side and the way your feet are burning through your thin flip flops on the concrete. Um, and your bathing suit is still wet and you feel shame because the girl you like the most is looking at you while your mom yells at you then. And then suddenly everybody cares. If you put us in the scene as it happened, showing us the details as they happen, then to the best of your recollection, the specific always makes it universal. The more specific we are, the more believable and, um, more empathy our readers will have for us. Mm -hmm. I have so many questions. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so many questions and and i hope everybody finds value from this because i know a lot of people want to write memoirs i've just been talking to some members of my husband's family and my husband's family is all lds and there's a lot of like genealogy mm-hmm. yeah. and so they want to write their stories yeah you know and i'm like and i love it i love it because everybody has interesting stories you know, every single person yes. does. Every yes. single person does. But if you just like date this happened on this date, this happened on this date, it doesn't capture the fact, <laughs> the interesting, yeah. 
<laughs> the interesting yeah. part is about it. Exactly. So I will, I will plug my book. I have a book called Fast Draft Your Memoir. Yes. Um, which is, so if any of your relatives say, well, how do I do uh-huh. that? Ella? You can say, well, I have a guide for you. It's a good, and Perfect. I basically, I, I, it's, it's my Stanford semester long class distilled down to a book. So you're getting a Stanford awesome. thing. <laughs> awesome. Oh yeah. Okay. So I wanted it. So that's kind of what I want to ask you. And it's probably what's in the book, but for our listeners. Oh yeah. Let's do it on air how do you because we all have like our own perspective of our life Mm -hmm. (laughs) right and it's like the Mm -hmm. whole thing and most people don't think of their life their lives as that's not even a word like but you know what i mean yeah um most people don't think of their self and their life as you know little vignettes (laughs) right right (laughs) like we're like this is the experience so how do you go from this is a whole of my life and everything is meaning (laughs) <laughs> to this is what I want to write this memoir about. Like, how do you choose what your theme or period of time is going to be? I have a couple of exercises and I'll just tell mm-hmm. you them now that I, that I have students use and it's all about restriction. The The number that you restrict them to is arbitrary. I just use six, but I ask them to write down the six pivotal moments in their life. And Mine at this moment, at the age of 46, my own pivotal moments are when I got married, when my mother died, uh, when I knew I wanted to become a writer, when my first book was published. I don't even know what the other two are. I can't think of them right yeah, now. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, those are, those are, and those are the top four that, that spring to mind. And, but they're always changing as we, as our lives move. Right. So I make them write them down and then they list them in order of what feels most important and fascinating to them. And then they, they kind of, you can either choose at that point to combine if all of your most pivotal moments are about something with your mother, then there's a very good chance that you're going to be writing a mother, daughter, mother, son memoir, right? Mm -hmm. So you're going to be combining that into a book. But if something, you know, if you have all these amazing things that happened to you and you also fought your way out of a jungle in Vietnam, um, you might be looking more into what did the war mean to me as a person and how did I change? So whatever jumps out at them. And then I do something, you may have heard of this. Uh, This is from um, Smith Magazine. They do the thing called the six word memoir. Have you ever played with that? I think so, but tell us more. It's so fun. So it's um, so Ernest Hemingway in a bar was said to have been challenged to write a memoir in six words. And um, it's apocryphal. Nobody can prove if he did this or not. But the but the saying that has come out of this that he, that they say he said is for sale baby shoes never worn. That's a story. That's a, it's six words. That's a story, you know. So so we talk about our lives in six words. Um, and I'm trying to remember one of mine. Whenever I have students do it, I do another one for me. But I think that um, like knitting and words equal my life. There we go. Like mm-hmm. or stitch, stitches and words equal my life. That could be a six word memoir for me. But but that's when I'm looking at the small things that build up into my life. I could take it from another angle. I could look at it from grief or I could look at it from love or I could look at it from a job perspective. Um, So you kind of play with those six word memoirs and you see what jumps out at you. And and usually all my students really know when I tell them the hard truth that you will not be able to write everything you want to in this book. So do your best with this book and write the story for this memoir. And then later, if you feel like coming back and writing a story about, you know, your dog who died, who was the most important thing to you. Then you get to write that memoir, but you can't write the do- the memoir about your life with your dog and your father's abuse. Mm-hmm. Those two things, I mean, probably somebody could, but those two things are so separate um, that there, there's, you wouldn't want to hang a whole book on both of them. Yeah. That makes sense. Yes, and people, it does. people do not like hearing that. <laughs> and perhaps they want to write an autobiography. And some older people do actually want to write the story of their lives. But just between you and me, that's less compelling than it a is. well-structured three-act memoir, you know, that keeps us turn, turning the pages, just like a novel does. Yeah. I think, I think everybody who's listening to this should do both. <laughs> Yeah, do both. I agree. My grandfather made he wrote his autobiography. Oh, and that's awesome. And there's always stuff that you like. I had no idea because I'm a generation removed. I never heard any of the stories. I didn't know. And I'm glad 
he didn't just pick one little vignette and I didn't get to know all these other things yeah. about him. Absolutely. Like, I have oh. this, I have this dream of taking mm-hmm. in um, like a memoir project or an autobiography project into the Zen hospice center in San Francisco. Oh. I, ju- I just keep meaning to see if I can do something with that. Cause wouldn't that be an awesome way to volunteer time? Yes. To be the scribe basically. No. Yes. Oh. Oral histories, dude. Yes. I took a class yes. and <laughs> in college (laughs) so cool yeah it was really fascinating i ended up interviewing my stepfather who had a cancerous brain tumor and passed away oh my three months later oh my god all of these um tape recordings at the time (laughs) recordings and uh and then did this oral history and was able to give all the tape recordings to my mom oh that's amazing what a gift it was rough but it was also really beautiful yeah and yet and that was a and that was a huge gift for him as well as the rest of your family yes you know yeah like, wow yeah see <laughs> memoir <laughs> you know and she, and i turned it into a you know i turned it into a kind of a biography of sorts but yeah that's nice. why i find this so interesting because because i the same college i took a native american women's course and this is what i thought i was going to take what I thought I was going to get was stories about Native American women. <laughs> like, uh-huh. you know, like, oh, there's these women, this woman did this and this woman did this. And if you go from, you know, if you go to, I just, that's what I thought I was going to get was so that I would leave the course being like, oh, and now I have this knowledge. Right. Of these women. And it wasn't a bad course. Like, it was still a fine course. It was more political. It was about the politics oh, of being a Native American so woman. You really signed up as a writer, though. Like, <laughs> your, your, your writer brain was like, yeah, stories, tell me a story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it being, being about the politics. And I did hear stories, but it wasn't like individuals. And I didn't, you know, yeah. I learned things. I learned a lot of stuff. And I was like, whoa, it's, you know, this is good that I knew this. But I... I probably would remember more if they'd been couched in stories. <laughs> exactly. You might retain it today. Yeah. yeah. I, I remember one of my very first book ideas before like, I had, yeah, I was probably 20 or something and really struggling, floundering in college. But what I wanted to do was make a coffee table book where I went into the local cafe in my little town on the central coast and just sat at every old person's table one by one and said, now you tell me your best story. Like the story, the story that everybody says, Oh my God, grandpa, tell that one again. Mm-hmm. You know, wouldn't that be an amazing oh book? Gosh. Just have a collection of the best told stories by normal, regular, everyday average. You know, this is a small town farming community that, that I uh, still, I still want to do that. Actually. <laughs> I live in a small town farming community right now. Yeah. So, yeah, yes. so, you know, these yes. ranchers have a lot to say. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Mostly to each other. <laughs> 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 at some point you, you need the one story because there's only so much conversation about cows that you can really you're like okay cattle exactly <laughs> um okay another question i had around memoir is so once you've chosen your you know whatever your theme or section of time is I imagine that a lot of people's section of time is somewhat emotional or their <laughs> their theme is emotional because that's yeah, definitely. why it was meaningful. Yeah. <laughs> that's why it was yeah. a turning point in their life. How do you, like I'm sitting there trying to imagine, you know, oh, my, my mom, my dad or whatever experiences in my life. And I'm like, this is painful. This is hard to, mm-hmm. this is going to be hard to, to mm-hmm. show, not tell. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> how do you, I don't know, I guess, how? question mark <laughs> oh there's i have i have like several answers for, for okay. how okay um number one write as if everyone you know and everyone they ever knew is dead you have to pretend that no one will ever see this mm. you have to write as true as possible with their real names in that first draft i have this theory that when you change a first name when you try to disguise somebody all of a sudden now you're writing a character instead of capturing actually you know Auntie mm-hmm. Anne, leave her as Auntie Anne till the till later. There's there's no danger that your book will accidentally leap out of your computer and into bookstores. If people are writing memoir and it is about people they know and it's hard and emotional, um, I always say to password protect the document, if not the computer. 
but you know, even if you, you normally leave your computer open for your kids to leave, look at, you can still password protect just the document. And if that makes you feel better, then do that. No one should see a first draft of anything, especially memoir. Um, so that, so, and that to say, write the absolute truth, the way you remember it. And, but it is hard and you have to remember that our brains, when we read words or we see something on a screen, um, the parts of our brains that would process that if these things were happening to us actually light up. So if you read a description about a boy getting onto a bike, um, just as I said these words to you, Ella, the mm -hmm. motor cortex in your brain is getting ready to ride a bike. Mm -hmm. If suddenly pressed, your the motor cortex is is set. If you um, if you read words like velvet or leathery, the sensory cortex of your brain is lighting up, and that's why we flinch when we see something scary on the big screen, and you know something jumps off the screen, and you scream, and you curl yourself into a ball and you cover your face. Um, your the front of your brain knows this, you're just eating popcorn in the theater, but the lizard brain, those, those, those parts of your brain that don't understand that actually believe they're in that simulation. So when we read books that are difficult to read, they can actually produce trauma. And when we write the words that were, uh, that are about something traumatic that happened to us, it can um, reignite that trauma. So you actually can be feeling traumatized by writing these things. So one thing to remember a lot is self-care. There has to be self-care involved. Um, you don't want to go head down face first into the manuscript and write for eight hours about, you know, finding out your baby sister was raped or something like that. Mm -hmm. God forbid, like you can't, you can't put that on yourself. Do a little bit at a time and then take a long walk, uh, do a little bit at a time and then take a hot bath and talk to somebody that you love. Really talking to anybody that you love is the best way to do this. Not showing the work to anybody, um, but talking to somebody and, and saying, boy, that was really hard and getting a hug or whatever it is that you need. I self-medicate with baths and a lot more reading of usually the opposite thing. If I'm writing something really dark, I'll be writing, I'll be reading a, you know, a light romantic comedy or something like that. Mm -hmm. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. With, so the, I guess the answer is um, you, you write the truth about people that you know and love with, with a lot of care mm -hmm. for yourself. Later on, you can figure out how to like get your family on board with the book if you need to. But when you're writing it, really, you're only concerned about yourself. Yeah. I think that's beautiful. Because if you're going to do it, you may as well let it be therapeutic. <laughs> Exactly. Just, <laughs> Which it won't be if you're writing the character Aunt Anne instead of actually Aunt Anne. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's a really good point. Although I do like to say it goes hand in hand with therapy. It can be very good with therapy. Some people, there are reasons not to write a memoir, and the I'm so angry is one of the reasons not to write a memoir. <laughs> it never, I'm going to show all of you. Exactly. It never works. They never take the message. They're usually dead when you're writing that kind of memoir. Like it just doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, and I guess I think that's kind of my next question or a good lead into. The other side of people being like, my story is so fascinating, is the people who are like, nobody's going to want to read my story. Yeah, that's most people say that. Yes. I wrote a memoir about sweater knitting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and I just, I like to tell those people just to trust themselves. I deeply adore a memoir that is about the smallest times in life, you know, people with, oh gosh, you know, May Sarton, have you ever read her? Mm -mm. Any of her, any of her journals. So it's not really memoir, but it's her journals. And I read them for comfort and strength. And I just want to read about how passionately she feels about the Dahlia's dying for the season. There's nothing else going on that, on that page, but the way she writes it so specifically makes it universal to me and makes me just want to stay there. Everything, everything that's well described and paid attention to becomes important for the reader meaning you can write about the smallest, quietest life and perhaps have an even greater effect on the, on the reader than, you know, some war hero that wrote about, mm. you know, coming home or something, you know? Yeah. Like Terry Tempest Williams. Yes. Oh, I yes. love her writing so yes. much. <laughs> like, exactly. So exactly that. Cause, and why do you think that is? Why do you think people find that those little moments interesting? Little, such a good question. Little moments um, are what life is built on. Like you can either have the Titanic hitting the iceberg, which is a real big 
you know, cinematic theatrical thing, or you can have the chill in your partner's kiss, which is completely silent, you know, which is, you know, but something has turned and something might even be more difficult than hitting the Titanic. If you live, that's just a good story. But if at this moment in time was when you realized that your lover was changing or moving away from you or you're losing your husband and it was, and nothing was said. It's just the way he set the glass down on the end of the counter that morning. That's fascinating. And if you can write that moment and have it mean so much that it's a turning point, that it's, you know, it's a dark moment. It's the context shifting midpoint. If you can do, if you can do it that way, it's just as compelling as the Titanic hitting the iceberg. Yeah. I think because, because nobody has, <laughs> no, none of us alive now have had that experience of the Titanic. <laughs> exactly. Iceberg. It's just a story. It's yeah. a fun story. It's entertaining. Mm -hmm. I mean, not a fun story. It's a terrible, <laughs> heart-wrenching story. But you know, yeah. like, I'm talking about the movie. Yeah. Okay. 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 <laughs> Like, oh, that's a bad example. I'm gonna get I'm gonna get so much feedback from this. That's not what I meant. But everybody, going back to my point though, was that you know, all of us have had a heart wrenching moment that yeah. was in a small little thing. And the same thing for joy, you know, mm -hmm. it's the 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 most joyful moments of my life have generally not been accompanied by a brass band and fireworks. They're just turning the corner on my street and feeling, oh gosh, I'm almost home. You know, mm -hmm. that is true joy. That's that's real. That and that's so what I want right. to see on the page. Oh my gosh, you're so right. Ah. I'm thinking about like some of my favorite moments that you know I will always remember. And it's like, so one of them, I was driving cross country with my boyfriend from college. And one, you, you know, a trip cross country is like when you find out. <laughs> yes, yeah. So it was, and we were both like 20. So woo. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, uh, anyways, but we stopped in Wyoming just to stop and pulled over and look at some view or something. Yeah. And got out of the car, looked over at a gorge. I think it was a gorge. And there was absolutely no sound. Wow. Like there weren't any b birds. There wasn't any, <laughs> any wind. There weren't any cars. There wasn't any sound. It was completely silent. Oh my God. And I will, you know, how, how can I ever yeah. forget that? But it, like, especially in the context of this yeah. ridiculous trip with this boyfriend who we got into a, you know, like we got into the huge fight, you know, like we, so many things, as as you can imagine, a road trip with with two teen, barely teen, barely not teenagers <laughs> in college, you know, and then to have this moment, and it's something you've never forgotten, and you just no. described it really well, and I could imagine you being there, and I could feel myself being there, and that's something that I could empathize with. Yeah, it was you know? so amazing. It yeah, was, it was like what? There's no sound. The only <laughs> other time I've had that is when you're in one of those soundproofing cone. Like yeah. the cones with the foam cones. Yeah. But this was been outside. In the isolation booths. Yeah. Yeah. This was out. It was amazing. Yeah. Okay. I get it. That's I'm beautiful. getting it. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody has something like that though. Everybody yep. has like a moment like that or, or multiples. That's life changing, but still very quiet and small, mm -hmm. but something you'll never forget. I, for me, it's like seeing glow worms on this New Zealand <gasps> pathway near a friend's house in the absolute pitch dark, um, walking with my mother and, and I was an adult by then and just looking in and seeing these glow worms and just again, silence and, mm -hmm. and beauty, you know? Yes. Yeah. yeah. <sighs> or like when a baby <laughs> smiles at you right at the right time and you're yeah. like, I am a good person. <laughs> This baby smiled at me, you know? Exactly. I love that moment. <laughs> Everybody's had a baby smile at that moment, and you're like, okay, things are okay. <laughs> this baby just smiled at me. So <laughs> it can't be that bad. <laughs> I love it. That's a good moment for a book, too, right? There. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So who's buying your memoirs? Or who is buying memoirs? And how do you, how do you market a memoir? This is not, this is out of the writing fun part and into the yay marketing. 
It's a, it's actually not too bad marketing memoir because there are people um, who really almost solely read memoir. Memoir mm-hmm. readers are voracious. They're kind of like romance readers in that that um, they want to read every memoir that comes out. So if you're actually talking down, you know, boots on the ground marketing, mm-hmm. um, it's real easy to target um, on AMS or whatever they're calling it now, the new Amazon marketing yeah. service. And, and also on Facebook, you just target um, the the your the right the authors that you want to show as your also bots. Mm-hmm. That's the best way, is what I've seen. Yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. Interesting. No, and also topically, of course. Like you know, I have a I have a friend and client who's finishing a book about her dad surviving a POW camp in World War II, mm-hmm. and so she's going to be able to target that too history buffs of world war two, especially mm-hmm. POW camp. So you can, you can always mark it that way too. Okay. Okay. Do some people write like essay memoirs? Yes. That can also be, um, actually the, the sweater book for me is a collection of essays, Okay, but they're still structured in the book kind of by act. Okay. If you can think of it that way, you want to kind of introduce yourself and build up and have a dark moment in there in the collection of essays. But yeah, that would, that would be a thematic memoir. And do you have multiple memoirs that you can, or me personally? Yeah. Or yeah, no, people. I just, I just have life in stitches right now, but I have two others that my agent, um, I'm cleaning up with my agent. So those, she's going to take those out as soon as uh, I finish cleaning them up. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So one, is, one is on, um, replenishing the creative well, cause I was, and yeah, it was like this, it was, you, you know what a stunt memoir is? I love these things. No, tell um, me. AJ Jacobs writes them and oh, Gretchen Rubin, year of happiness. Okay. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. I have that. So basically you take a year or another specific amount of time and you challenge yourself to do something. So I did one of those stunt years where every month I challenged myself to do something different and then write about it. And that's the first one we're taking out. And then there's another um, collection of essays on creativity. So yeah. Mm, yeah. Interesting. Like I'm thinking right now I have a self, a self-help book and i'm in quotes here self-help but it's yeah. basically like a memoir with that's my here's... favorite kind of self-help book yeah i will, will one click that yeah i think i need to i think i made it self-help with a little bit of memoir but it would probably do better if it's memoir with a little bit of self-help it will do better i can yeah. promise you that people um always want to hear about the person behind the book most no matter mm-hmm. how great the advice is you have to give if you can if you can open it and close each piece of advice with how it reflected in your life really truly oh it's mm-hmm. so fascinating that's what i want to read yeah yeah. Do it, girl. I know, I know. I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> I, and here's like what everybody listening is doing is, is I'm doing the same thing. I'm like, I have so many interesting things in my life that other people should know about me. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's like the navel gazing society unite, but yes. it's it's so fabulous. And I'm really, I'm really addicted to um, the personal narrative essay to just on, as it stands on its own, and that's just having such a resurgent. Um, online offline but but on in online magazines you know like even even medium is now mm-hmm. purchasing for a lot of money really great essays so there's all these long form essays that you can read out there that are basically miniature memoir and that's actually a, that's actually a great way to market i I've, I've published quite a few of those and i get readers from them who said you know i read your piece in lady some journal and i followed you over here because what you said you know resonated so much with me so so you okay. can do that Okay, what is it? And I missed it because I was thinking while you were saying <laughs> it. <laughs> what is this? This one year? What is the one that you're doing about creativity? Refilling oh, your creative right. well. So yeah, that one was called replenish, and I was yeah. just feeling super emotionally and spiritually bankrupt. Um, and in 2017, so I spent 2018 doing things that I, I wondered if they would refill my well. Like one was um, gardening, one was being outside every day, one was exercise, one was meditation, um, one was, oh, I can't even remember all of them now. <laughs> but, um, but they, oh, one was a month of reading. I didn't look at, I didn't look at the computer. I, I wrote on the computer, but otherwise I just did email and I didn't look at social media once. I spent all of that time Mm-hmm. And no TV, no, no, nothing, nothing except books. And that was incredible. That was really, really wonderful. And it did come to pass that I filled the well that year. I figured out what was wrong and it wasn't any of those things that I thought it was, but, um, but that's what the book's revelation was, was that I hadn't been looking in the right places. 
So oh, that is so kind of, interesting. It was really fun. It was really fun. And that's and just I, a kind of memoir. I, exactly. You're expanding my definition of memoir so much right now. Look up, look up AJ Jacobs sometimes. He does the best ones. He did uh, The Year of Living Biblically, where, you know, his poor belabored wife, he he, <laughs> he lived every rule in the Bible. Um, and then he had, uh, and he's not particularly religious. I think he might be Jewish. <laughs> and he, then there's another one where he he took on every single thing that could improve your health, including fads, did that for a year. Um, he read the entire encyclopedia one year and wrote a book about it. And he's fabulous. He's, okay. he's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> and what are these essays? Like, do you have, can you give us an example of one of the kind of sh- long form essay memoir? Is there one that you're like, this is a good one to read one of yours, for- maybe. <laughs> oh. Can I think about that and then link yes. you back? Because I'm yes. blanking out. All I can think of is one in Vox. Um, She's going to come back to us yeah, I will. later and we'll make sure to link it in the show notes <laughs> so that we can see exactly what she's talking about and be like, yeah. oh. Yes, I have a couple I can send to you. Yeah, because I have. Me. Yeah, awesome. Oh, I love this. Oh, I love this so much. <laughs> I'm like, oh, because I, this way that we're talking about memoir is the way that I think about life. Yeah. And I hadn't thought of, I didn't know that. So we're talking about when we're talking about writing fiction, and I've said this before, writing fiction to me is like baking. Like I love to bake. Yeah. But I don't want it to be my job because then I wouldn't love it anymore. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) If I had to get up at four in the morning, every morning to go bake, (laughs) I wouldn't love it anymore. And so writing fiction is kind of like that for me. I do it for fun. But if I had to do it for my living, it wouldn't be what I loved anymore. But, but this kind of self helpy taking my experience and using it to help people stuff that I can do every day, nonstop, like okay. all the time. Do you want me to blow your mind just even a little yes, bit more? Please, please. Because I feel the same way and writing fiction is my day job now. So I still, I get up and I'm like, Oh God, I got to go write some fiction. And then I think you got to go write some fiction Yeah, get over yourself. This is amazing. But I do kind of sometimes have that slog, but like you, I can write self helpy stuff all day long, all day long. And I and memoir based and I just love it. So what I did was a few years ago, I set myself up on Patreon and I deliver to my readers an essay every month <sighs> and they're on a theme. So in 2018, that theme was replenished and I was delivering to them the first draft of this essay that would go in the collection. So every month I'm getting Patreon money from people who pledge to me. And I'm paying myself the advance for this book that might be, that will probably be traditionally published, but if it doesn't sell, then I will self-publish it. Right? Your mind is blown. Your silence is your mind. Yeah, I'm like, what? And you could, you could do that. (laughs) What? You too could do that. If anyone would like to check, okay, here's my self, my my self, but patreon.com slash Rachel, and it's spelled funny, R-A-C-H-A-E-L. You can do what I did to, um, oh gosh, what's her name? She's Amanda Palmer. I just support Amanda Palmer on Patreon because she's so good at it i just give her a buck a month because i want to see what she's doing mm-hmm. so if any of your if you have any realists wanting to do that just give me a buck a month for a while see what i'm doing yeah. and then unsubscribe i won't notice you know? yeah <laughs> oh rachel is spelled like Raphael, but with exactly or like like exactly <laughs> instead of a p not any i've never heard anybody get that so quickly <laughs> yes, I've always loved the name Raphael because we're only one letter away. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, see, I told you by the end of this interview. <laughs> <laughs> it was by the start. Of I it. told you. Okay. <laughs> um, oh my gosh. I could, I feel like I could talk to you forever. I love this so much. Um, <laughs> Okay, we'll go look at Amanda Palmer. We'll go find your Patreon. I'm going to go sign up because I'm going to be like, what is she doing? And how do you- copy me. That's how we do this in this life. You yes. know, we figure out what everybody else is doing and we make it work for us. I know. That's way possible. Yeah. I know. How do you, okay, how do you find these people who want to do your Patreon though? Okay, so Patreon is problematic in that it is not, um, Kickstarter, you can have some, uh, organic growth. Like people actually do troll Kickstarter mm-hmm. to look for things for fun to fund that they think are interesting. Patreon, you have to bring your own community. So you mm-hmm. have to have some kind of mailing list or a large Facebook following or a small Facebook following. And, and you are fine with writing these essays for maybe the $10 a month you collect for a long time. Cause mm-hmm. that's, that's awesome. But it is something that, um, is really you're supported by your fans. So, so are you someone fans... with a podcast say oh. would do quite well, Ella. <laughs> I have a Patreon for 
this i'm wondering i'm curious you know i, you I just started you can one. always pivot you can I, always pivot on a patreon yeah i'm really curious about you know self-help essays are not the same as you know tips about writing but yeah. everybody who listens to me for any length of time knows that the hardest part about writing is the mindset Ex- so exactly. they are relevant <laughs> And you don't, you don't even need to ask for permission. You just say, you know what? Exciting new guys. I'm go- uh, news guys. I'm going to start writing about mindset in all areas, including writing. Yeah. And the one, you know, person in, in Philadelphia, I don't, I like Philadelphia. I don't know why I'm picking on it, but the one person in Philadelphia says, how dare she, she can't have my dollar anymore. It's fine. Another dollar will mm-hmm. replace that. So yeah, just pivot, pivot anytime. And then you turn it into a book later and then, <gasps> oh and my maybe, gosh. And I, ha- I have a Patreon set up that I do not get paid unless I produce a thing. So it's not mm. like the calendar turns over and I get paid. I could, I could not deliver an essay for three or four months and I won't get paid. Oh. So I must do it by the 31st. I started it this morning. It's the 28th. <laughs> <laughs> Usually on the 28th is when I start my next essay. Oh my gosh, I love so many things about this too, because I find myself having not as much time as I want to journal. Yes. And because I'm busy all the time, but that would that's what this would be. It'd be like a journal exactly. entry every month. Oh my yes. gosh. It really, ah. is. it really is. Right now I'm doing, I, this year I'm doing this um, spend less challenge, you know. Yeah. Kind of thing. And this month I am updating them on how it's going and what I have been able to not spend and what I had to spend. Oh my gosh. It's so Rachel. fun. I know. I'm like, <laughs> oh my gosh. <sighs> okay. Okay. Well, let's keep this conversation going. Will you be on my podcast soon? Yes, Perfect. absolutely. So then you can, we'll, we can we'll go, we can... cross pollinate that way. Awesome. Okay. And I'll you have other you. nonfiction about writing. Uh, yes, I have a book called Onward Writers, which is just a collection of um, the essays, uh, the, the, sorry, the emails that I send to my writers list. So it's just emailed encouragement. And if anybody wanted to join that free list of emailed encouragement, mm-hmm. that's at rachelheron.com slash write. And you just said something about a podcast. Where can people find your podcast? <gasps> oh, yes. um, my podcast is How Do You Write? And it's available at all of the podcaster places. And what it is, it's a um, podcast about writing process because I am fascinated by, I want to know the kind of pen you use. I want to know when you write because I'm always looking for the magic bullet and I can't, you know, I'm never going to find it. There's nothing will ever make writing actually easy, but I always want to talk to writers about how they do it. So, yeah, I love that too. I love that too. Oh, go on. No, you go on. Oh, I was just going to say, I have another podcast called The Writer's Well, and it's about uh, the writer's life from craft to wellness, and I co-host that with Jay Thorne, and that's really fun, too. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Wait, the writer's craft from... Uh, the writers, uh, we talk about the writer's life from craft to wellness because we really think of it as a holistic approach, and the podcast is called The Writer's Well. Mm, yeah. Wellness. See, this is why, this is why I'm like, You're, we're each other's people. Yes. Tribe. <laughs> yeah. I love this so much. Okay. I have a feeling we could chat and love each other for hours and hours, but I wanted to close up with you with what is your best advice for people who want to be able to quit their job and write full time? It's, it's, um, it's the, I have to go with the cliched thing is that, and this took me so long to realize, but if I just wrote for 30 to 45 minutes a day, which is what I did when I worked the 12 to 18 hour shifts that I worked for many years, I would write 30 minutes before I went to work. And that meant getting up at 345 or four. And when I finally committed to start doing that on a, not on, not on a daily basis, but on an almost everyday basis, um, those 30 minutes of writing just added up into books. I wrote so many books in 45 minute bursts, or there's one book I can actually remember. I was having a hard time. I was depressed. There was some other stuff going on. And I wrote that book in 15 minute bursts. Just, I would put on write or die that, that app and I would just write for 15 minutes and catch what I caught. And then I would revise it later. Um, so don't wait, don't wait for, a long stretch of time when you can like settle into writing, you want to get yourself into a place where you can write at the drop of a hat, bad writing, terrible writing that you can fix later. Mm. Yeah. That's, that's my, that's, that's my best good, advice. That's still good advice. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> and some, and you know what? Everybody needs to hear it on this occasion because we're like, well, yeah, it's a good advice. And then we're like, but is it really? And you forget. I, and then later exactly. you're like, it is. 
And I recently, I just, this is within the last two weeks, and I'm confessing this, I have been giving this advice on writing a crappy first draft and technically believing it, but, you know, for years and years and years, and technically I know that's true that we all write a crappy first draft, but I just caught my brain a couple weeks ago saying, but do I have to, maybe I'm the exception, maybe this time this first draft is going to be perfect, the first time out the gate, and I was like, okay, brain, you're just lying, now you're just lying, I mean, so, so we all fall into this trap of hoping we're the exception. No, we just have to write a crappy first draft and fix it later. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Even somebody who's written dozens of books yeah. still and, and who literally writes books about how to write and has a podcast <laughs> about how to write and <laughs> still is one? like, but is it true for I, me as well? Exactly. <laughs> and I just want to add one more really quick thing because I know that there's listeners going, well, you know, but I revise as I go. I can't revise. I can't move forward if what's behind me is not good. And I want to say to those people that I believe that some people revise as they go, but the only people who get to revise as they go are people who are completing books. If you are revising as you go and you don't complete books, then that's not your process. And you just have to write a crappy first draft and fix it later. Yes. Right? Oh, yes. And in my entire career, I've only met two people who actually do that. Mm -hmm. And when they type the end, they send it to their editor. And I really hate them. I'm very, <laughs> very jealous. <laughs> I mean, I love them. They're my friends, but boy, are they jerks. I know one person who does that. <laughs> oh, wow. I know one person. Isn't it, isn't it amazing? Maybe two people. That person. And I'm oh. like, but they spend a lot of time outlining. Yeah. yeah. Like, it's like one of them's like, I know the whole book. Yeah. Before I start writing. Cannot like, imagine you know, scene by scene. I would love that. You know, and so that's it. But the, the, it. <laughs> they're, that's, they have an entirely different writing process, though. They, yes. They've yeah. outlined the whole thing. Yeah. Scene by scene. Right. They're I not. love thinking about process. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so great. Okay. <laughs> so everybody needs to go check out her podcast so we can find out all the, all the different ways that people make that's, and that's the thing I love about completing <laughs> is finding out he, how people complete their stuff. Yes. That's the that. real secret sauce. Yeah. Yes. So awesome. And there's so many different ways to do it. And it's not all just the one way that we yeah. think it is. What's right is the only thing that's right is the way that works for you to get you yeah. to the page regularly catching a few words. Mm -hmm. That's the only way that's right. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And where... Because you have all these things happening. Where is the best place for people to find you? <laughs> uh, probably rachelheron.com. Um, Rachel spelled like Raphael, R-I-C-H-A-E-L, Heron, like the bird, but with two R's, H-E-R-R-O-N. Um, I'm also, I'm a fan of Twitter. I am terrible at Facebook, um, but you can usually find me on Twitter if you want a quick response to something. Um, and check out my Patreon and the podcasts. Yeah. I'm all over the place. Yes, everywhere. And I'm, and I'm going to be on this podcast and I can't wait. So thanks so much for having me. This was just such a delight to talk to you. Yeah, I, I had a feeling it would be like this when I reached out, <laughs> when I looked at your website and I was like, I love her already. <laughs> <laughs> love that. <laughs> yeah, I know. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you taking the time to, to chat. Thank you, Ella, and happy writing to you. Thank you. And hugs and happy authoring to everybody who's listening here at Author Like a Boss. Hey bosses, if writing stories that readers in your genre super fan over is one of the challenges that's keeping you from making six figures as an indie author, then you'll want to come to the next Author Like a Boss Masterclass, where you'll learn exactly what you need to do to become an empowered six-figure indie author. You can sign up for the free masterclass at authorlikeaboss.com forward slash A-L-A-B masterclass. If you love the Author Like a Boss podcast, we'd love for you to subscribe, rate, and give a review on iTunes. Until next time.